Good morning, happy Sabbath. We want to welcome you to our online service this morning here on Facebook. We're so happy for you to be here. Uh, we are welcoming you from your pastor and your first lady. Uh, we thank you so much for your presence this morning and we're going to get into uh, a couple of announcements now and we thank you so much for tuning in and we pray that God blesses you throughout this service. Good morning and happy Sabbath. So elated to be with you today. Um, this weekend is especially, especially important for Christendom all around the world um, because it marks a momentous time in our history where we can take time and sit and ponder the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And today I want to spend a little time in God's Word um, really reiterating the things that have been done for us through Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection. We know that this is a point in time that many Christians look forward to uh, because it reminds them that the love of God is so great for us all. Without further ado, I want to get right into the message for this Sabbath. And the word of God uh, that we're going to be pondering, the, the portion that we're going to be pondering this morning is coming from Romans, the fifth chapter, Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five, and we'll read from verse six down through verse 11. Romans chapter five, verse six down through 11. And the word of God says this, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. This is verse eight. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10. For if when we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now been received, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Mm. I'd like to speak under the topic or the idea, Christ the prisoner. Christ the prisoner. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come to you in prayer. And once again, like we've done before, we're gonna ask that you would speak your thoughts, you would fill our hearts, and you would blow our minds. And we'll be careful to give you all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this particular passage of scripture is very important for us uh, because it gives us a clear understanding of the predicament or the, the condition that we're in um, as to the necessity for God himself to come uh, and be our sacrifice and be our, our, our substitute for the things that we deserve. The Bible makes clear in Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, 3.23, it makes clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 makes clear that the wages of sin is death. And Jesus himself had to come and, and die for our sins. But I want to look a little closer to what that actually means and the ramifications of and the conditions uh, that we were in as for the necessity for Jesus to come, uh, that we might get a clearer understanding and a better appreciation for what Christ did some 2,000 years ago on Golgotha, 
nestled between two thieves and those that deserve death, standing and and, and spectating at the uh, at, at Jesus, the Son of God Himself, claiming to be there on the cross, dying a sinner's death. Uh, we we have to take time and consider what actually was going on, how it affects us, and how we can have hope for the future. Amen. So let, let's let's get into this thing. Verse six, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Oh, when we were still without a, a map, when we were still without the ability to do for ourselves, when we were still without the idea of how grave our situation was, the Bible says, Christ died for us. And this, this, this whole idea of being without strength reminds me uh, of a child, um, particularly in the infancy stages of life. Um, many, many people know, parents, you can attest to this, but babies, when they are fresh, when they still have the price tag on them, when they, when they are just uh, have been born, they really don't have the capacity. Uh, they really don't have an idea. They really don't have the strength to be able to care for themselves. Um, they cannot feed themselves. Uh, they cannot wash themselves. And one of the things that I think represents our condition uh, especially as it pertains to Romans chapter 5, uh, the, where, where Paul says, when we were still without strength, one of the things that I think accurately portrays the condition that we were in deals with a baby in a diaper. Um, because the baby has no strength, because the baby has no, 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 no knowledge of how to do these things, the, because the baby's motor skills are not... Are not uh, uh, all working properly and they have not developed their motor skills in a way where they can fend for themselves because I, 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 I because they're in this condition it rep represents accurately the position that we were in before Jesus came and died for us when we were still without strength in other words when we were still without the ability to care for our boo-boo we uh, are wearing diapers uh, and, and if anybody knows anything about diapers if you leave that diaper on that baby uh, if you allow that baby to 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 stay in that soiled diaper or, or that that stinky diaper it does not go away uh, if you ignore it uh, if, if you turn a blind eye to it if if you if you let the baby stay in there as a matter of fact the, the opposite is uh, the reality. It gets worse with time. Uh, the diaper becomes more stinky. Uh, the diaper becomes more detrimental to the health of the baby. Uh, the baby will now experience a uh, diaper rash and the baby will now experience uh, petrified uh, um, feces within that diaper. These things are not good. And in us, uh, when we were still sinners, when we were still in our weakened state, the Bible says, where Paul says, when we were without strength, the ability to fend for ourselves in this whole realm of spirituality, in this whole realm of sin bearing down on us, we could not clean ourselves up. We could not make a way for ourselves. We could not even walk the straight and narrow because we were without strength. Look at this. The Bible says, when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. My, 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 my. So, uh, and it, it, it reminds me also uh, of kids. Um, and I'm going I'm to use a lot of kids because I, I believe it, it appropriate for us to be um, recognized and us to, to recognize ourselves as children of God. And as children, you know, uh, they will get themselves into messes that they cannot get themselves out of. 
um, even beyond the, the infancy stage, when, when it's the toddler stage and they're beginning to walk around and explore things and uh, be inquisitive about things, sometimes uh, they will take pens uh, and they will take markers and uh, if there's more than one child, they, they will take pens and markers and they will take makeup and different uh, uh, things around the house, flowers, sugar, those things. They will get into them things, those things and they will start playing with those things and putting them all over their skin and putting it and strolling it all over the floor to the point where they work themselves into a mess that they cannot get themselves out of. The Bible says, when we were without strength, when we were at our lowest point, in due time, Christ died for us, just like a parent having to come and bail their child out and clean up the mess and, and, and take all the permanent marker or paint over the permanent marker that's on the wall. Somebody say amen, because I, I, I believe uh, that at one point in time in, in my in my in my past, and I'll say past, amen. Uh, we all have a past, and, and put your hands up if you believe that thing. Uh, in my past, I believe that I did some things, uh, amen, uh, that cost my parents a lot of money. Uh, uh, being destructive and, and and tearing up and doing things uh, that I really could not get myself out, and I had to be bailed out just like you have had to bail your child out and you have been bailed out at one point or another in your life by your parent. At that point, at the point where you could not do anything for yourself, that's the point where by the Bible says, in due time, Christ came and, and died for the ungodly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and the Bible says, verse seven, and I want you, I, oh, I want you to get this thing. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Oh my, 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 my. Let's look at this thing. So, uh, this, this thing is, is, is very, 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 very humbling because even even for somebody uh, that the Bible notes, for, for a righteous man, uh, for somebody that is upstanding, for somebody that is, is good, for, for, for somebody that we deem is worthy, the Bible says we will scarcely die for that person. In other words, it's rare even for us to die for somebody that we deem does not deserve death. It's rare for that to happen. Uh, and, and even more so, it's, it's, it's even uh, more rare for a good man, uh, for, for yet perhaps for a good man, uh, someone would even dare to die. Oh. Paul puts this in here to compare or, or, or contrast um, the, 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 the difference between us and Christ. It's hard for us to even die for a good man or a righteous man, uh, Paul puts it here. Um, notice what Paul does not say in, in, in verse 7. Notice what Paul doesn't say. He does not say for us to die for a bad or wicked or evil man. Because in our minds, uh, you did what you did. You deserve to die. You, you rightly deserve uh, to serve this prison sentence. Uh, you rightly deserve to be thrown under a jail or you rightly deserve the death penalty. Uh, in our minds, if you're wicked, if you're evil, if you've, if you've only sown bad things, you deserve only to reap bad things. An eye for an eye or a two for a two, you deserve what you put out. If you put out bad, you deserve bad coming back to you tenfold. That's our mindset. And yet, look, the Bible says, even in that context, 
we would rarely die for somebody that has been doing good. Oh, uh, and, and, and it is a righteous man. But in our minds, we would deem an evil person deserving of the fruits uh, uh, that they have borne on their, their, their trees. Uh, they have borne fruits of evil and seeds of wickedness. Uh, they deserve to reap uh, fruits of, of evil and seeds of, of wickedness. That's what they deserve. Yes, they deserve to die in our minds. But look at this. Verse 8. This is the contrast between us and God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. <laughs> Thank you, God, for your love. Uh, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -mm 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 -mm. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There are some realities that I want us to ponder uh, in this text about our lives. Um, first, we have to look at the compare and contrast of this thing. You know, uh, uh, this is not the, the bullet points, but I, I, I'm setting up, I, I'm laying the foundation for, for the points that I'm going to give you. Look at this thing. The comparative contrast of verse 7 and verse 8 is mind-boggling. We, won't, we would barely die for somebody that does not deserve death. But the Bible says Christ demonstrates his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. My God. So the people ah, that we deem as, as un, uh, uh, unworthy, unsalvageable, the people that have done evil deeds that we believe deserve to die and deserve the rewards uh, that they they that you reap what you sow, they deserve to reap the evil that they sown out. Those people that we deem a, a, as worthy of death and worthy of the consequences of those actions, those are the very people, we ourselves included in that, those are the very kinds of people that Christ came and died for and, and, and sacrificed his life for and are, are, uh, are, are focused on in verse 8. While we, we, us, together, we, our, us, us, me, you, us, while we were yet sinners, while we were in our mess, Christ died for us. There are three realities um, that I want to uh, 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 leave with you uh, this morning uh, from the passages of the scriptures that we're looking at. The first thing the first thing that we have to understand uh, is that we are guilty. In other words uh, like verse 8 says we are sinners. We are sinners. We were sinners. We are sinners. We have to re we have to understand that we are, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and in us being sinners, uh, we are guilty. Um, and I, I I'd like to compare this thing, and, and um, we we have to I look at this this idea of us being guilty and us being sinners. We were subjected to a life sentence. Of living in sin and then dying after we've lived a life subjected to sin. If this was a life sentence without the chance of parole, uh, without the, 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 the chance of good getting out on good behavior, we deserved our sentence. What was our sentence? Uh, Romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is that our sentence was living a life of sin and then dying in sin that was our sin that was our sentence because we were subjected to sin through Adam 
We were subjected to living a life of sin and then dying in sin. There was supposed to be no hope for us. So the first thing we have to realize, we are guilty. We are sinners. We deserve to be in prison in this long life of sin and then dying in sin. That's what we deserve. But look at this. I want you to see this. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners at our lowest point in the very act of our mess and caught into our, our, our addictions and our habitual behavior, living a life that is only self-centered and not Christ-centered, we, while we are at our lowest point, still sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. And that's, that's point number two. Christ died for us. Now let's look at the ramifications of this thing. Um, this automatically references Christ being our substitution. You remember in verse 7 where we're talking about uh, we would barely, rarely, scarcely die for a righteous man, a good man, a, a upright man, someone where we deem does not deserve to die. We would rarely die for them. Christ died for us when we were spitting in his face, pulling out his beard, beating him on his back. He died for us while we were nailing him in his hands and in his feet and piercing him in his, he died for us then. And this is what that means. Because Romans 6.23, we deserve to die. Romans 3.23, all of us are in the same boat. So don't think you've escaped this thing. Or uh, 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 maybe he, he he's talking about for the people that don't live a, a good life. Or, Everybody, all the Bible says, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in this state, in this state of us coming short of the glory of God and us all being sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. He took our place when the wages of sin were bearing down on us. When death was a certainty for us, when death was guaranteed for us, the Bible says Christ died for us. And let me explain this thing. The death that the Bible dictates is not what we see now after we have received uh, the fruits of, of Jesus' labor. This death is that eternal separation, this life prison sentence that we deserve. Christ, in other words, instead of us being handcuffed and, 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 and ushered to our prison cell, Christ said, look, no, 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 no. I will be handcuffed for them. I will be led to the prison cell of death and the grave. So they won't have to experience it. Christ died for us. He took our life sentence so that we would not have to experience it. So number two, we have the, the, the realities of, of, of this, this passage, the realities of our Christian life, the realities uh, that we now get to experience are because we were, or do, or we were guilty, but we no longer have to live um, uh, subjected to what the Bible dictates should happen to us because of sin, because Christ, the Bible says, says while we were yet sinners, Christ came and was the substitution for us. Somebody ought to shout amen. Because if it had not been 
for Christ coming and paying the price that I could never pay, that I would never make enough to pay, that I could never do enough to pay, that I would never live right enough to do, if it had not been for Christ coming and doing beyond what I could do and uh, exceedingly above what I could even think, if it had not been for him doing that, we would deserve and we would be on a straight shot to hell and straight shot to death. Somebody ought to give God praise this morning. Christ died for us. Verse 9. And much more than having now been justified by his blood. So no, 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 now let's look, let's look at the ramifications of his death. Much more than having been justified by his blood. So the death that we were supposed to die, the nailing on the cross, the condemnation that we were supposed to suffer, Christ experienced that for us. And because his blood streaming down on Calvary's cross, we, his blood being spilled up because he was embodying uh, his role as the Lamb of God, that John says, that takes away the sins of the world because he spilled his blood for us. Look at this. The Bible says we have now been justified. Somebody ought to shout amen. By his blood, we have been justified. That's why Isaiah in chapter 53, we were, he was what? Wounded for our transgressions and he was what? Bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of his peace, of our peace was upon him and by him spilling his blood, by him being nailed to the cross, by his stripes, the Bible says we are healed. Somebody ought to shout glory, hallelujah, because if it had not been for Christ being our substitute, if it had not been for Christ dying for us, taking our place, where would we be? The Bible says that we have now been justified by his blood. We shall, oh, look at this, look at this thing. It says, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And just like Isaiah 53 uh, 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 dictates and, and, and illustrates throughout its, uh, um, its uh, text, um, many of us have gotten this thing wrong. And we believe that um, we can do something to save ourselves. Christ is the only reason we have salvation. Yeah, I know the Bible says faith without works is dead. Yeah, yeah it does say that. But don't you think that you can work hard enough, you can work good enough, you can work long enough to deserve the salvation that Jesus gives? Look at this thing. Not even a righteous man, as, as Paul dictates, or a good man deserves what Jesus did for us. But I, I praise God for the grace and mercy that he bestows on us, those things that we cannot... Uh, uh, receive or or buy or um, secure for ourselves. Salvation is one of those things that we cannot secure for ourselves. That's why Jesus had to come himself and die for us. And that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He had to do this, do, do these things because we could not do them for ourselves. That's why. And having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. What is that wrath? The wages of sin, the death that we deserve to, 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 to experience, the condemnation that we deserve based on our actions, based on our lives. We deserve these things. But the Bible says that we are saved from that wrath through his blood. And it further iterates the substitution or the magnitude of what Christ did for us in that he paid the price for our sins so that we would not have to experience the wrath uh, of our actions and the consequences of our actions. That's why the Bible says that we uh, shall be saved from the wrath 
through who? Him, not through ourselves. God, 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 God. Y'all better hear me on this thing. We are saved through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That's why Paul says, uh, when he's going to preach, I, I, I preached a lot of different ways and I, I'm very eloquent. I, I, I know how to preach the word of God and I, I preached a lot of ways and I preached a lot of things, but I, I, I've learned something and he's speaking to the Corinthians that I, I've come to you and I've I professed and I've claimed to know nothing more than Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because nothing else is salvific and good for salvation be other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the gospel right there. We're saved from wrath through him, through Jesus and Jesus alone. Not through our works, not through our actions, but because of the actions and because of the life because of, of what he did for us on the cross, it's only through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Ooh, ooh. So, so I, I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna look at the reality. First, we have to look at the reality in this text that we deserve to die. We were sinners. We deserve to die. The second reality that we are looking at is that Jesus died for us as a substitution for us. He didn't have to do it, but he did. He died in place of us. But the third reality we have to look at is that this, he was raised for us. Ah, okay, let's look at this thing. Verse 10 again. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, and we, we, we just mentioned that, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Pastor, what are you trying to say? Jesus being raised for us is a guarantee, a down payment on what is to be done for us. Ah. And Paul goes on to say uh, in, in, in later chapters, if the same, it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that's that same power living within us. And if he raised Jesus from the dead, we can be sure that that power has also the power to raise us from the dead. Look at this, look at this. This text, verse 10, is, is showing us and telling us, yes, uh, the price, uh, the, the, the reality is we were sinners. Christ died for us. But the guarantee that, that we shall be saved, the guarantee that, that this, this whole thing was not for show, is the fact that he was raised. Oh my goodness, look at this. Um, we would have no hope if Jesus was still in the grave. Now I want you to look at this thing. We would have no hope if Jesus was still in the grave. Because if he came and died um, and, and claimed to be the savior of the world, died for us, but he was still in the grave, it would be very problematic for us to believe and very impossible even for us to believe that the word of God says the same power that uh, raised Jesus from the dead, if he was still in the grave, it, it, that text would be obsolete. What do you mean the same power that raised Jesus from the dead? He's still sleeping in the grave. And we would have no assurances that 
the same power that raised Jesus from the dead could raise us from the dead because he would still be in the grave. So in order for us to have uh, some hope, in order for us to have some resolution in our belief, in order for us to have a, an idea of what is to come for those that believe in, and take the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as, as a, a substitution for their own, uh, for their own lives and their own sin, in order for us to have some hope, there would need to be some evidence of the power of God being able to do what we have deemed impossible. Because uh, one of the things um, that was very sure was that the death of the grave, the, 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 the prison of the grave was something that was absolute and forever before Christ was raised from the dead. Even though uh, there were uh, previous miracles, even in the Old Testament, Elisha uh, raising uh, a child from death and, and even uh, Jesus himself raising the widow's son and Jairus' daughter and, uh, and even Paul raising the young man that fell out of the window. Uh, these, these evidences are so, so, real in scripture, yet the greatest, and Jesus raising Lazarus, but the greatest form, look at this thing, the greatest idea uh, and the greatest show of power was Jesus himself being raised from the dead. The greatest assurance that we have is Jesus being raised from the dead because it shows us that when the Bible speaks about the same power that, that raised Jesus from the dead, it's that same power that in the last days is going to raise the dead in Christ. And that same power that is going to conform and change uh, us in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, that same power is the hope of all the believers, all the Christians that believe in Jesus Christ. So the realities are, the realities are, we were sinners. Christ died for us, but we ought to thank God that he was raised for us to give us an idea and the peace of mind that this same power, this same uh, Holy Spirit power that raised Jesus from the dead is that same power that lives within us, that same power that is, is, is going to save us, the same power that we can look forward to when Jesus comes again. And that same power that we will reconcile to God. And look at this, verse 11. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. One of the things that we have to understand is that when Christ became the prisoner in our place, when Christ took the life sentence for us, when Christ died the eternal death for us, <clears throat> he did the homework and then look at this. He put our name on it. And all that God sees when it comes to our sinful selves, if we have accepted Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, God sees his son and not our mess. Somebody ought to shout glory on that thing. Because if he saw me for what I truly am, what I've done and he judged me based on who I am and what I've done I would deserve death ten times over but I'm so happy that God demonstrates his love for us that even when I was yet sinning doing my own thing slapping God in the face living my life being a selfish, uh, a selfish human being, even in that state, 
Christ died for me. And I don't know about you, but that gives me joy in my heart. And you ought to be happy and you ought to rejoice because Jesus lived. Yes, he died, but he's raised. And Paul said that he's sitting at the right hand of God. Remember, remember that the same power that raised Jesus is that same power that can raise us and keep us. So friends of mine, during this Easter weekend, take time and ponder on the realities of what Jesus has done for you, the realities of the cross, the realities of his sacrifice, the realities of our predicament, and the realities that one day Jesus is coming again. And if we would but commit ourselves to him now, live for him now, accept his sacrifice now, we can be made ready for his coming that is soon, yet even at the door. Christ, the prisoner. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your sacrifice, for your substitution. We thank you so much that you loved us enough that you died for us. Now, Father God, we know we're guilty, but we're thanking you that you died for us. We know we're guilty, but we thank you that you raised for us. We know we're guilty, but we thank you for the reconciliation that you've given us. Now, Father God, we ask right now that you would help us even in this season of Easter, this uh, time where we take and ponder what you've done for us. I ask that you would give us a, 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 a renewed relationship, a renewed uh, mind that we could even now be touched at our hearts by what you've done for us. Let us not um, let us not go through this this Easter season just out of formality because we're Christians. But Father God, help us to seriously ponder what you've done for us. And Father God, when it's all said and done, may we accept your sacrifice. May we internalize it. May we share it with others. And Lord, save us when you come. And we be careful to give you all of our praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath, and I hope to see you soon. Be blessed.